Cryptography is essentially important because it allows you to securely protect data that you don't want anyone else to have access to. It is used to protect corporate secrets, secure classified information, and to protect personal information to guard against things like identity theft. And today's video is basically going to be about cryptography. Now, before we actually jump into the session, let me give you guys a brief on the topics that we're going to cover today. So first of all, we're going to cover what is cryptography through the help of a very simplistic scenario. Then we are going to go through the classifications of cryptography and how the different classificative algorithm works. In the end, I'm going to show you guys a nifty demo on how a popular algorithm called RSA actually works. So let's get started. Now I'm going to take the help of an example or a scenario to actually explain what is cryptography. All right. So let's say we have a person and let's call him Andy. Now suppose Andy sends a message to his friend Sam, who is on the other side of the world. Now, obviously, he wants this message to be private and nobody else should have access to the message. Now he uses a public forum, for example, the internet for sending this message. The goal is to actually secure this communication. And of course, we have to be secure against someone. Now let's say there is a smart guy called Eve who has secretly got access to your communication channel. Since this guy has access to your communication, he can do much more than just eavesdrop. For example, he can try to change the message in itself. Now this is just a small example. What if Eve actually gets access to your private information? Well, that could actually result in a big catastrophe. So how can Andy be sure that nobody in the middle could access the message sent to Sam? The goal here is to make communication secure and that's where cryptography comes in. So what exactly is cryptography? Well, cryptography is the practice and the study of techniques for securing communication and data in the presence of adversaries. So let me take a moment to explain how that actually happens. Well, first of all, we have a message. This message is firstly converted into a numeric form and then this numeric form is applied with a key called an encryption key and this encryption key is used in an encryption algorithm. So once the numeric message and the encryption key has been applied in an encryption algorithm, what we get is called a ciphertext. Now this ciphertext is sent over the network to the other side of the world where the other person who the message is intended for will actually use a decryption key and use the ciphertext as a parameter of a decryption algorithm and then he'll get what we actually sent as a message and if some error had actually occurred he'd get an error. So let's see how cryptography can help secure the connection between Andy and Sam. So to protect his message Andy first converts his readable message to an unreadable form. Here he converts the message to some random numbers and after that he uses a key to encrypt his message. After applying this key to the numerical form of his message, he gets a new value. In cryptography, we call this ciphertext. So now if Andy sends the ciphertext or encrypted message over communication channel, he won't have to worry about somebody in the middle of discovering the private message. Even if somebody manages to discover the message, he won't be able to decrypt the message without having a proper key to unlock this message. So suppose Eve here discovers the message and he somehow manages to tamper with the message and message finally reaches Sam. Sam would need a key to decrypt the message to recover the original plain text. So using the key, he would convert a ciphertext to numerical value corresponding to the plain text. Now after using the key for decryption, what will come out is the original plain text message or an error. Now this error is very important. It is the way Sam knows that message sent by Andy is not the same as the message that he received. So the error in a sense tells us that Eve has tampered with the message. Now the important thing to note here is that in modern cryptography, the security of the system purely relies on keeping the encryption and decryption key secret. Based on the type of keys and encryption algorithms, cryptography is classified under the following categories. Now cryptography is broadly classified under two categories, namely symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography, popularly also known as public key cryptography. Now symmetric key cryptography is further classified as classical cryptography and modern cryptography. Further drilling down, classical cryptography is divided into two, which is transposition cipher and substitution cipher. On the other hand, modern cryptography is divided into stream cipher and block cipher. In the upcoming slides, I'll broadly explain all these types of cryptography. So let's start with symmetric key cryptography first. So symmetric key algorithms are algorithms for cryptography that use the same cryptographic keys for both encryption of plain text and decryption of ciphertext. The keys may be identical or there may be some simple transformation to go between the two keys. 
The keys in practice represent a shared secret between two or more parties that can be used to maintain a private information link. This requirement that both parties have access to the secret key is one of the main drawbacks of symmetric key encryption in comparison to public key encryption, also known as asymmetric key encryption. Now, symmetric key cryptography is sometimes also called secret key cryptography, and the most popular symmetric key system is the data encryption standards, which also stands for DES. Next up, we're going to discuss transposition cipher. So in cryptography, a transposition cipher is a method of encryption by which the positions held by units of plain text, which are commonly characters or groups of characters, are shifted according to a regular system so that the ciphertext constitutes a permutation of the plain text. That is, the order of units is changed, the plain text is reordered. Now, mathematically speaking, a bijective function is used on the character's position to encrypt and an inverse function to decrypt. So as you can see that there is an example on the slide. So on the plain text side, we have a message which says meet me after the party. Now this has been carefully arranged in the encryption matrix, which has been divided into six rows and the columns. So next we have a key, which is basically 421635. And then we rearrange by looking at the plain text matrix and then we get the cipher text, which basically is some unreadable gibberish at this moment. So that's how this whole algorithm works. On the other hand, when the cipher text is being converted into the plain text, the plain text matrix is going to be referred and it can be done very easily. Moving on, we are going to discuss substitution cipher. So substitution of single letters separately, simple substitution can be demonstrated by writing out the alphabets in some order to represent the substitution. This is termed a substitution alphabet. The cipher alphabet may be shifted or reversed, creating the Caesar and Abstash cipher respectively, or scrambled in a more complex fashion, in which case it is called a mixed alphabet or deranged alphabet. Traditionally, mixed alphabets may be created by first writing out keyword, removing repeated letters in it, then writing all the remaining letters in the alphabet in the usual order. Now consider this example shown on the slide. Using the system we just discussed, the keyword zebras gives us the following alphabets from the plain text alphabet, which is A to Z. So the ciphertext alphabet is basically zebras, then followed by all the alphabets we have missed out in the zebra word. So as you guys can see, it's zebras followed by S, C, D, F, G, H, and so on. Now suppose we were to actually encrypt a message using this code. So as you guys can see on the screen, I've shown you an example, which is a message, flee at once we are discovered, is being actually encrypted using this code. So if you guys can see out here, the F letter actually corresponds to S and then the L letter actually corresponds to I out here. Then we actually get the cipher text, which is S I A A Z Q using the code and the process that I just discussed. Now, traditionally, the cipher text is written out in blocks of fixed length, omitting punctuations and spaces. This is done to help avoid transmission errors to disguise the word boundaries from the plain text. Now these blocks are called groups and sometimes a group count that is the number of groups is given as an additional check. Now five letter groups are traditional as you guys can see that we have also divided our cipher text into groups of five and this dates back to when messages were actually used to be transmitted by telegraph. Now if the length of the message happens not to be divisible by five it may be padded at the end with nulls and these can be any characters that can be decrypted to obvious nonsense so the receiver can easily spot them and discard them. Next on our list is stream cipher. So a stream cipher is a method of encrypting text to produce cipher text in which a cryptographic key and algorithm are applied to each binary digit in a data stream one bit at a time. This method is not much used in modern cryptography. The main alternative method is block cipher in which a key and algorithm are applied to block of data rather than individual bits in a stream. Okay, so now that we've spoken about block cipher, let's go and actually explain what block cipher does. A block cipher is an encryption method that applies a deterministic algorithm to the symmetric key to encrypt a block of text rather than encrypting one bit at a time as in stream ciphers. For example, a common block cipher AES encrypts 128 bit blocks with a key of predetermined length that is either 128, 192 or 256 bits in length. Now block ciphers are pseudo random permutation families that operate on the fixed size of block of bits. These PRPs are functions that cannot be differentiated from completely random permutation and thus are considered reliable until proven to be unreliable by some source. 
Okay, so now it's time that we discuss some asymmetric cryptography. So asymmetric cryptography, also known as public key cryptography, is any cryptographic system that uses pair of keys, which is a public key which may be disseminated widely, and private keys which are known only to the owner. This accomplishes two functions, authentication, where the public key verifies that a holder of the paired private key sent the message, and encryption, where only the paired private key holder can decrypt the message encrypted with the public key. In a public key encryption system, any person can encrypt a message using the receiver's public key. That encrypted message can only be decrypted with the receiver's private key. So to be practical, the generation of public and private key pair must be computationally economical. The strength of a public key cryptographic system relies on computational efforts required to find the private key from its paired public key. So effective security only requires keeping the private key private and the public key can be openly distributed without compromising security. Okay, so now that I've actually shown you guys how cryptography actually works and how the different classifications are actually applied, let's go and do something interesting. So you guys are actually watching this video on YouTube right now. So if you guys actually go and click on the secure part besides the URL, you can actually go and view the digital certificates that are actually used out here. So click on certificates and you'll see the details in the details tab. Now, as you guys can see, the signature algorithm that is used for actually securing YouTube is being SHA-256 with RSA and RSA is a very, very common encryption algorithm that is used throughout the internet. Then the signature hash algorithm that is being used is SHA-256 and the issuer is Google and Internet Authority. And you can get a lot of information about sites and all their authority key identifiers, their certificate policies, the key usage, and a lot of thing about security just from this small little button out here. Also, let me show you a little how public key encryption actually works. So on the site, which is basically cobwebs.cs.uga.edu, you can actually demo out public key encryption. So suppose we had to send a message. First, we would need to generate keys. So as you can see, I just click generate keys and it got me two keys, which is one is the public key, which I will distribute throughout the network and one the private key, which I will actually keep secret to myself. Now I want to send a message saying, hi there, when is the exam tomorrow? So now we are going to encrypt it using the public key because that's exactly what's distributed. So now, as you can see, we have got our ciphertext. So this huge thing right out here is ciphertext and it absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. Now, suppose we were to actually then decrypt the message. We would use the private key that goes along with our account and we would decode the message. And as you guys can see, voila, we have hi there, when is the exam tomorrow? So we have actually sent a message on the internet in a very secure fashion. Above that, there's also RSA that needs some explaining because I had promised that too. Now RSA is a very, very commonly used algorithm that is used throughout the internet and you just saw it being used by YouTube. So it has to be common. So RSA has a very unique way of applying this algorithm. There are many actual parameters that you actually need to study. Okay, so now we're actually going to discuss RSA, which is a very popular algorithm that is used throughout the internet. And you also saw that it's being used by YouTube right now. So this crypto system is one of the initial system. It remains the most employed crypto system even today. And the system was invented by three scholars, which is Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Len Adelman. Hence the name RSA. And we will see the two aspects of the RSA crypto system. Firstly, generation of key pair, and secondly, encryption decryption algorithms. So each person or a party who desires to participate in communication using encryption needs to generate a pair of keys, namely public key and private key. So the process followed in the generation of keys is as follows. First, we have to actually calculate N. Now N is actually given by multiplying P and Q, as you guys can see out here. So P and Q are supposed to be very large prime numbers. So out here P will be 35, but for some very strong encryption, we are gonna choose very large prime numbers. Then we actually have to calculate Phi. Now Phi, as you can see, the formula goes is P minus one into Q minus one. And this helps us determine for the encryption algorithm. Now, then we have to actually calculate E. Now, E must be greater than one and less than phi, which is P minus one into Q minus one. And there must be no common factors for E and phi except for one. So in other words, they must be co-prime to each other. 
Now to form the public key, the pair of numbers N and E form the RSA public key system. This is actually made public and is distributed throughout the network. Interestingly though, N is a part of the public key and the difficulty in factorizing a large prime number ensures that the attacker cannot find in finite time the two primes that is P and Q that is used to obtain N. This actually ensures the strength of RSA. Now in the generation of the private key, the private key D is calculated from P, Q and E. For given N and E, there is a unique number D. Now the number D is the inverse of E modulo phi. This means that D is a number less than phi such that when multiplied by E, it gives one. So let's go and actually fill up these numbers. So N should be 35 out here. And if we generate them, we get the value of phi, which is 24, which is basically four into six. And then we should also get E. It's now E should be co-prime, so we are gonna give it 11, as 11 is co-prime to both. So now for the actual encryption part, we have to put in E and N out here. So E out here for us is 11 and N is 35. And then we are gonna pick a letter to actually cipher, which is A. And then we are gonna encode it as a number. So as you guys can see, we've encoded it as one. And out here, now after we've given the message its numerical form, we click on encryption and we get it. Now to actually decrypt the message, we are gonna need D and N. Now D for us was five and N was 35. So five and 35. And then we're gonna take encrypted message from above and we're gonna decrypt this message. So after you decrypt it, we have the numerical form of the plain text and to then decode the message, just click here, decode message. And as you guys can see, we have decoded a message using RSA. So guys, that's how RSA works. I explained all the factors that we actually use in RSA from N to five to E to D. And I hope you understood a part of it. If y'all are still more interested, y'all can actually research a lot on RSA. It's a very in-depth cryptographic system and N. Now D for us was five and N was 35. So five and 35. And then we're gonna take encrypted message from above and we're gonna decrypt this message. So after you decrypt it, we have the numerical form of the plain text and to then decode the message, just click here, decode message. And as you guys can see, we have decoded a message using RSA. So guys, that's how RSA works. I explained all the factors that we actually use in RSA from N to five to E to D. And I hope you understood a part of it. If y'all are still more interested, y'all can actually research a lot on RSA. It's a very in-depth cryptographic 